on time. Why don't we stay in and take 37 and a half seconds and greet someone. Tell me you're glad that we're together. Did we have an amazing day? We've had an amazing day that begun with an incredible night on last night. All right, you got 17 and a half seconds left. Thank you for being in place and on time. If we do nothing else, we're going to be on time. We're going to be committed. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Simply horrible. <laughs> the Lord's been good to us, hasn't he? The Lord has been amazing to us. We are grateful to God for the privilege of our time together. This is our second night of worship. We have one more night of worship, and then we conclude, of course, on Thursday. Uh, we start at 9 with worship, then presentation by our provost, and then... Uh, then we transition to University Chapel with our student and our faculty of our university. Tomorrow, we spend time doing the luncheon with Dean Emeritus John Kenny. That's going to be good. But before you even get there, we have amazing preaching, incredible conversation, intentional stretching conversation that should happen within the academy and so we're grateful to God. I am excited tonight that our worship leader is one of my classmates. We came together uh, in 1988 walked through this process graduated together in 1991. He serves as the dean of the school of, of the Leonard Smith School of Religion at, uh, at Virginia University at Lynchburg, uh, amazing man. Dr. James Coleman is my brother, and we love each other dearly. And I think it's interesting. You wanna know what's interesting? That the two historic, predominantly black seminaries in the state of Virginia are led by the same clan. Okay, y'all missed all of that. In 1991, this seminary produced two eventual deans, same class. Yes. Let's get ready for an amazing time of worship. Come on, my brother, Dr. James Coleman, gonna lead us in worship. Thank you, Dean Guns. Come on, let's begin to give God praise, glory, and honor. My goodness, what an awesome opportunity we have to be together in this place. And so would you join me in our invocation? Dear God, we acknowledge your presence in this space. We thank you for the opportunity to be inspired and informed. And we trust you that our gathering this evening will allow our good to become better and our better best. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, just nine days away from Thanksgiving. I know we have a myriad of reasons to be thankful, but at the top of the list, I know we are all thankful that God created, established Virginia Union University and the Samuel D. Witt Proctor School of Theology. Y'all just have to excuse me. Dean told me to be who I am. Come on, let's just take 15 or 30 seconds. Stretch.
dust on your feet and give God some praise. Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It's Ellison, Joe, Convocation of the greatest campus of the greatest historical black college and university in all the world. We are excited. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, you may be seated. We're delighted tonight that our worship will be enhanced by the musical gift and ministry of Minister Joseph Haynes. Come on, let's celebrate as he shares in our opening selection. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. We're going to make one big praise team. Come on, let's do it all together. Song says, I came to magnify the Lord, praise his holy name, lift Jesus higher. I just came to magnify. Come on, put your hands on it right here. It's a old song. Come on. We're going to take it back tonight. Is that all right? Come on. Song says, I came to magnify. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him higher. Lift Jesus higher. I just came to magnify. I just came to magnify. I just came to glorify. I just came to praise him. I see a few. You come on, put your hands on. I came to magnify. I came to magnify. Come on, see praise is holy. Praise is holy. Song says, lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus.
Hallelujah. Wasn't that all right? Oh, my goodness gracious. Listen, this is the second evening of this great opportunity to learn and grow together. And we thank God for the leadership of my classmate, Dean John Eric Guns, an amazing gift to the body of Christ. And if you were here last night, I am told that Queen Mother Dr. Patricia Gould Champ was amazing, reimagining the Jericho Road. Wow, and tonight, Dr. Jerry Carter. Listen, our devotional period will now be led by Dr. Ruth Segris, a colonel in the Air Force, and she's going to come and give us the intimacy of the presence and power of God. I'll be reading from Micah, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 8. Micah 6, 1 through 8, and it reads, Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against God's people. God is lodging, lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I have brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. What shall I come before the Lord and bow before the exalted God? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings? What calves, a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body, the sin of my soul. God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Pray with me. And since you bid us seek your face, believe your word and trust your grace, we cast on you our every care, and we stand now in this sweet moment of prayer. We stand as our ancestors metaphorically with knee bowed and body bent, as empty pitchers before a full fountain, saying, fill us on tonight, God. Fill us with more love. Fill us with more grace. Fill us with more mercy. And God, when you fill us, we ask that you break us empty us out, a kenosis process that we might pour out the blessings on all that we encounter, that we may reimagine a world full of love and full of you, that we might stir the waters so that others would see the God in us and feel the love of God flow from us. God, in this worship experience tonight, we ask that you have your way as only you can. And so, God, we will glorify you in this moment. We will give you honor in this moment. You will receive the lips of our praise. You will receive the activity of our hands and our feet. So, oh God, reign, rule, and supreme in this place as only you can. God, move flesh out of the way, and may the glory of God be revealed and seen and felt in each one of us. God, bless our dean. God, anoint him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Bless STVU as we continue to matriculate people that will go out and spread the gospel of liberation, the gospel of love, the gospel of transformation and God when we come on these hallowed grounds may we look back over our life and remember that this is the Lord's doing hey and it is marvelous in our sight may we not get too high that we forget to give you glory we realize that everything that we have you gave it to us 
We realize that all the blessings you bestowed upon us came only from you. So tonight, God, with humble hearts and a hungry spirit, we say feed us from manna from on high. Bless now your preacher of this hour. Give him that anointing that makes preaching easy. And as we pray in the pews, may our hearts be receptive to what thus said the Lord. This is the prayer that I offer in the only name that can save, heal, and deliver. The salvific name of Jesus the Christ. Thank God and amen. Come on, thank God. Every victory is a prayer of victory. Thank you, Dr. Segrist. Come on, Minister Haynes, and lead us higher.
Be seated, be seated. We don't we don't wanna we don't wanna have a disturbance. <laughs> we don't wanna disturb. <laughs> wow. Those of you who appreciate ethnomusicology, appreciate the music ministry of this wonderful team. Come on, give God praise. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to bring forward my classmate. I want to say that all of us who enjoyed being in class with our dean, we are honeymoon happy and peacock proud. My parents graduated from this institution. My wife, I have. I owe a debt of gratitude and I cannot come on this campus without making sure I have a check in my hand. And so won't you welcome one more time one of the most amazing practitioners of the faith, an intellectual, a leader, a giant in our time. Warmly welcome now the dean of our school, the Samuel D. Witt Proctor School of Theology. He's going to come welcome us introduce the preacher and do whatever else he wants. Dr. Gunn, here's a contribution from your classmate and I'm going to keep on supporting you forever and ever. He, he must have read my mind. Can we give God praise for Dr. James Coleman? Um, as always, I want to acknowledge our president and his administration to my, to my, uh, to those who serve with me uh, in academic affairs, uh, to our faculty, and can we celebrate our faculty? Would our faculty stand once again? Would our faculty stand? I'm going to always celebrate our faculty. I'm going to always celebrate our faculty. Uh, Dr. Smith, you did all right today. You were amazing. And I need to, and I need to correct something. Uh, Dr. McKenzie said he didn't preach. Well, if you didn't preach, you flirted with it. <laughs> but you've taught a whole lot of people in this room how to preach. And we thank you for your sacrifice and service. Over 40 years. Over 40 years, of, man, wow. And, and, and while I see as well our, our Old Testament scholar, Dr. Wafernaka, who is just a, he is an amazing man. It's so, we're, we're, we're so blessed. Um, I do want to acknowledge our staff that's here. Uh, my assistant, uh, Dr. Carl Lightfoot, who's taken on an enormous weight. Um, and she's done, a, as always, an, an incredible job. She made decisions. She wasn't staying stuck in her office tonight. She was coming to church. Carla, where are you? Somewhere in here. Amen. Amen. There you are. First person I met when I came on this campus as dean, uh, other than uh, Dean Dover Martin, was Dr. Paul Flowers. And, and God has orchestrated an amazing relationship. And he's the pastor-elect of the Antioch Baptist Church. We're super excited. And, uh, you know, I'm a Baptist preacher, so I'm going to be smart and acknowledge my wife, um, who is, uh, she has made it to Ellison every year uh, since I've been dean. And I am grateful to each and every one of you how incredible it is that we share together 
in this. Um, um, John Lewis once said that a democracy cannot thrive where power remains unchecked and where justice is reserved for a select few. Ignoring these cries and failing to respond to this movement is simply not an option. For peace cannot exist where justice is not served. These words were not spoken in the 60s or the 70s. They were spoken while dying, he was fighting for George Floyd justice in policing act. These words are not words from the past. They're words that painfully still resonate in our present. When we were preparing for Ellison, my heart was moved to see how we could once again look with an intentional way this, this social transformation, this social justice, and the assignment and craft of preaching. School theology has always been known as the place that prepares the black church to receive the preacher. There are many of you who for all of the courses that you took, uh, you were stretched by the voices of the homiletician, the craftswoman or man that pressed us in preaching. So tonight, we give God praise that our mission as a seminary is clear to prepare the women and men of God to serve the black church and the black community and this wayward country because we need to reimagine the Jericho Road. And it's time to trouble some water. So we give God praise for the glorious opportunity to be here tonight. As the 11th Dean, Assembly with Proxy School Theology, I challenge you, both alum and students, to not mismanage this glorious week. Keep connecting each other, keep inspiring each other. Remembering that in 1941, Dr. John Marcus Ellison, one of the namesakes of this conference, uh, birthed within his tenure as the first black president of VUU, a graduate theological institution that we knew then as the School of Religion, but we know now at the Sam DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. I challenge you as we move deeper into our worship to do a couple of things with me. One, protect the integrity of our inheritance. Love your school. Let's say that again. Love your school. Let's say it again. Love your school. Okay? Let's try it again. Love your school. Presidents come, deans come, but Virginia Union has remained. So to these hollow grounds and dear old walls, may they forever be. Dear Union, I'm going to say it every night, we still love thee. And my encouragement tonight is for you not to mismanage that, but join me in protecting who we are. So welcome once again to the 74th and a half year of the Ellison Jones Convocation, which means that in 24, we're gonna have a real big celebration of 75 years. So plan to be here again some as graduates, some as continuing students, some as alum. This morning, I woke up at 4.30. My, my, heart, my heart was grieved, and please take me seriously tonight. My heart was grieved because I wanted to ask a question, are we taking ownership of our school. 
There are 45 words that are synonyms to ownership. But there was four that stood out to me. Partnership, possessionship, claim, and strangely enough, slice. And it hit me that when you are truly a lover of your school, you take ownership of a slice of it. You become a partner in its success. It is tough when students line up at my door or at the door of the, of the dean needing financial support. It is tough when our events are grossly underfunded by our participation, but we are amazingly blessed by the gifts that come from our school. So tonight, my welcome, my welcome words to you is join me and take ownership. I wrote this, and I'll be done, as almost in tears this morning, repenting unto God for getting here to be dean, but not always honoring it on my way. I sat in the seat of my ancestors, and I got here, but I didn't always honor it. And God will give grace to the foolish, but will require accountability to those who understand. Some of you tonight need to repent with me for strategically putting the School of Theology on your CVs and your bios, but not making it a priority with your resources. Some of you need to repent with me for claiming it as a part of your heritage, but not protecting it with your integrity of commitment. Some of you need to repent with me for bragging about your professors and your classmates. But when we need you, you seemingly are too busy to invest. So God, we're sorry. Because this is a sacred place. And we understand the value of it. Many of you, like me, walked in here unprepared, scared, unsure. But you walked out ready to tackle the world. Thank God for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology and everything that comes. Okay, I guess I'm by myself. Thank God for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor and everything that comes with who we are. Tonight, we take ownership of what is impacting our lives and changing us. So I'm going to ask them to put the QR code up with intentionality for giving. I'm going to ask you to take ownership with me. We have a very simple campaign we started over two years ago. My brother actually encouraged it. It's 500 for 50. We asked persons to give $50 a month, 500 of us. It would be over $300,000 a year just in that. On tomorrow, we will receive your gifts, your commitments, and your donations. Two of my classmates have already given. Ty Colonel Palmer and, and Dean Coleman. So join us. So right now, pull out that phone and take ownership of the next generation, of the next scholar, of the next PhD, of the next dean, of the next college president, of the next pastor, of the next chaplain, of the next social activist. Take ownership of that person who will make a difference in the world because of your commitment as an alum 
and I dare say as students, so that we're practice school theology. Tomorrow, I'll share some vision at the luncheon, some things that God is doing in our school. So thank you for hearing my heart and for partnering with me to do better for a place we all need and a people we can't do without. So welcome again to the Ellison Jones Convocation. And let's continue to thrive. Tonight our preacher is a dear friend. He came on a couple of years ago to, as an adjunct to teach preaching, hermeneutics and the like. And his voice and his message has been such a profound blessing to so many of us. I'm honored tonight to have Dr. Jerry Carter here, and we look forward to what God will say tonight through him. Our music ministry that has blessed us. Haven't they blessed us this week? Our MD? Yes, sir. <laughs> and to those who have just blessed us. They're going to sing, and then Dr. Carter's going to come. And I got a feeling that these next few days are going to be absolutely amazing. Turn to your neighbor and just greet them one more time and tell them I am an owner of my school.
Lord, we call your name tonight, Jehovah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Gracious God, our, our Savior, and Lord, we are so grateful that you have brought us together one more time. We thank you for the fact that you are God of grace and mercy. And so we pray tonight that you would create some space for the proclamation of your word, break up the fallow ground in our hearts and plant the seed of your word in the soil of our hearts that it might bring forth fruit in the days to come. For this we are grateful in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the day the Lord has made and we rejoice and we are glad in this day. God is a great God and greatly to be praised. As a matter of fact, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised to the leadership of this institution, um, to our dean, to Lady Guns, and to all of you, my sisters and brothers in the Lord. Good evening. Great to be in church. Great to be in church tonight and to be gathered for this uh, 74 and a half years of this amazing convocation. I've been hearing about uh, so much and just grateful to be able to come and be a part of it this year and to share and to see what is going on. I um, want to salute my brother and my friend. I do not use those words lightly. Dean Guns uh, is my boy, is my friend, yeah. and just the uh, amazing leadership, incredible preacher, uh, doing work all over the United States and, and beyond. So thank you for the invitation, as well as those who are responsible. Good to see all of you here. Got a family here from one of our, from one of our families from Calvary Church in Morristown. Great to have them here on tonight as as well I want you to turn with me for a few minutes to uh, the book of Genesis Our worship leader yes sir book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 that ought to be easy to find <laughs> Genesis 1 and 1 and I'm reading from the New International Version In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning. And there was evening, and there was morning. The first day. Amen. I want to talk about from chaos to cosmos, from chaos to cosmos. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm a real fan of old school music. Like some of you, I, you know, I appreciate the new stuff, but I'm into the old school and particularly the 1970s. I got some partners in here on tonight. Um, and, and in particular, from the 1970s, one of my favorite groups was the Temptations. I'm talking about the old Temptations, Paul and Otis and David and Eddie and Dennis, all of them. 1971, they recorded a song uh, entitled Ball of Confusion. They imported some of the uh, upheaval from the late 1960s into the 70s. Vietnam uh, protests, the uh, obvious vicious forms of racism, civil rights movement, the free love, the use of narcotics. They impor imported all of that into the early 1970s and they came up with this song, Ball of Confusion, people moving out, people moving in. Why? Because the color of the skin. Run, run, run. Okay, I feel like I'm in the right house on tonight. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, vote for, set you free. Rap on, brother, rap. They, 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 they came, they, 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 recorded this song, Ball of Confusion. On that same album, having been influenced by this psychedelic sound, there was another song they had called Cloud Nine. And Cloud Nine was a place where you could escape when you got too tired of the ball of confusion. And for the temptations, that's what it was. It was a place of escape. That was cloud nine. And don't look at them too uh, judgmentally on tonight because when any of us, when many of us are in context of chaos, the temptation is to want to fly away to cloud nine. Escapism becomes a real attractive option. Escapism into uh, drugs, escapism into isolation, escapism into busyness, even escapism into ministry becomes a way that we seek to get out of chaos. We feel like David who looked around and saw all that he was going through and said, if I had the wings of a dove, right? Any Bible readers here, I would fly away and be at Rest. The, the, the option of escapism becomes real tempting when you are in a context of chaos. I am not committing hyperbole or any kind of exaggeration when I say that one of the words that characterizes and describes our present time is that of chaos. I don't need to go through the litany of everything that is going on over in Gaza, what's going on on in Congress, what's going on in terms of climate change, on and on. It is not an exaggeration to call what we are going through as chaos. But here is the good news on tonight. Is that Genesis chapter 1, whatever else it says, it says that God specializes in doing something about chaos. As a matter of fact, the first manifestation of dysfunction that God dealt with was not sin, but it was chaos. The beginning of the Bible is God 
dealing with the enemy of, 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 of humankind, and that is chaos. And it's very interesting that God, in this chapter, deals with chaos on a cosmic level, which probably means that God is trying to show us that God is able to do on a societal level what God has first done on a cosmic level. And what God has done on a cosmic level, God is able to do on an existential level. So all I'm trying to say is that maybe Genesis chapter 1 is not just a cataloging or a chronicling of God's creative genius. Maybe Genesis chapter 1 is a parable of power. That Am I in church on tonight? That gives us some indication of what God is able to do with chaos on a cosmic level, on a societal level, and also on an existential level. God deals with chaos. This might not be deep enough for you all who are here on tonight, but I'm looking at somebody who, who whether they articulate it or not, is dealing with their own context of chaos on tonight but look at what the good news is the bible here says that at one point god and chaos lived in the same neighborhood in the beginning god that, that god and chaos live right next to each other that the existence of god did not mean the absence of chaos and the existence of chaos did not mean the absence of god that chaos lived in one place and god lived on the other place they were living in close proximity to each other look at what the bible says there was god in the beginning <laughs> I said in the beginning, God. The uh, Bible does not prove God's existence. It just presents it. It just assumes it from the, in the beginning, God. Um, nothing calls God to be God. God was the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover. God was there. There wasn't a time where God was not. I know this is old Sunday school stuff for y'all, but God was self-existent, pre-existent, and nothing was responsible for God's being. God was just there in the beginning. God, Elohim, this plurality of God, this plural sense of I don't know, maybe, maybe, and I don't want to read too much into it. I know i got scholars here today, but maybe the Godhead was involved even in creation. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit worked uh, harmoniously and lovingly at dealing with chaos, which says to me that whatever chaos I find myself in, I got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together in my behalf to get rid of the chaos. There God was in the beginning. In the beginning, God created can you see it? Didn't make. God created. People make. God creates. People, um, Kowloon uh, 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 invented paper and Galileo invented the telescope and on and on and Charles Richard Drew uh, invented or founded blood banks and on and on and on. But people are always called makers, not creators because makers have to have some pre-existence raw materials in order to make what they make. But God is called a creator because everything that God needed to make what God wanted to make, God found in God, that there was nothing outside of God that God had to use in turn feels like I'm alone in here, that God did not need any raw materials from anybody else. That's why we do not call God a maker. We call God a creator. In the beginning, God created. Y'all don't mind if I preach the Bible here? That God created. In the beginning, there was God. But there was also chaos. They lived with each other. They were staring at each other. There was chaos. 
Look at how it's described. God didn't have much to work with. It was chaos. Uh, empty form. Uh, formless. In other words, it was disorder. Uh, darkness. Nothing could grow. Uh, deep waters. Destruction. God, all God had was disorder, darkness, destruction. That's all God had to work with. Eugene Peterson looked at it and called it a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness. It's all God had. I know, I know, I know the Western mindset calls it creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. That's what the Western mindset calls it. The Eastern Orthodox mindset says that God did not create ex, ex nihilo, but God created from chaos. Well, whether you see it as out of nothing or chaos, chaos is bordering on nothingness anyway, and chaos is as close as you can get as not what All I'm trying to say is that from the beginning, God just had a mess. But I'm here to announce on tonight that God does pretty good working with a mess. As a matter of fact, God, sometimes God waits until circumstances are as messy as they can get. Uh, you, you know God could have gotten to Bethany earlier than four days dead, Lazarus had. You know he could have gotten to Bethany the moment he heard that Lazarus was sick, but God knew that, uh, uh, the, the Lord knew he would get more glory from raising a dead Lazarus than from healing a sick Lazarus. Sometimes God waits until circumstances, I'll preach by myself, uh, until they are as messy as they can get because God does a great job working with mess. Here is the chaos. Here is chaos on a cosmic level. Here is chaos on a societal level. And here is chaos in your own existential situation. The question on tonight, and I'm going to put it out there and get out of your way, is how does God deal with chaos? Now, if you've never been in any chaos or you're not in any right now, I give you the permission to get up and leave because I'm about to scratch where you're not itching. But even if you've never been there, take this little feeble message, put it in the freezer and thaw it out because you need to know how our God deal. Anybody here interested in what God does with chaos? Can I tell you what God does? It's real simple. First of all, God hovers over chaos. One, two, three, four. I, it, it's, 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 he, the Bible says that, 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 that God was hovering like a bird, spread God's wings over the chaos. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, uh, that, uh, that, that darkness covered the deep. But God covered the darkness. So whatever is over me, God is over that. It, what, what, whatever, what, I don't know what's over you right now. But whatever it got, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering. Do you see it? Hovering over the darkness that was hovering over the depth. <laughs> y'all not helping me here. That, and, and whatever else that may mean is that the Holy Ghost was the first fruits of what God was about to do. Oh, man. Y'all, you haven't read Romans chapter 8 where the Holy Spirit is called the first fruits of the believer? Well, here, when it says that, that the Spirit hovered over the water, it's almost as though the Spirit was uh, teasing chaos to give it a foretaste of the creative order that was about to be introduced. 
that even when you are in chaos, the Holy Ghost hovers above you and shows you what God is going to do. So he wants you to rejoice, not in what God has done, but just in the tease, because the gospel teases you with better. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the wind, the Ruach, was hovering above the water, which says this right here, that God had control even in the chaos and that the chaos could have been much worse if the spirit wasn't hovering over it. Can I tell you why your chaos is not any worse than what it is? It's because the Holy Ghost is hovering. You, you think things are bad. You think things are what they are, but you don't know where you would be Right now, there are millions of microbes, toxins, and fungi, and bacteria that are airborne, such that you ought to be sick every day. Every day, everybody in here ought to be sick. But the reason why you don't get sick as often as you could is because he is. The reason why people in your church, pastor, cannot get to you the way they want to. You think things are bad, but the Holy Ghost is hovering. And what the Spirit does is the Spirit manages chaos until God decides to change it. Come here, come here. I know most of us only shout after the chaos is changed. But you ought to shout for the fact that God manages chaos. I came all the way from New Jersey to announce to some brother, some sister, that, that, that whatever chaos you're in, I want you to know it seems like it's out of control. But he's hovering. What does God do with chaos? Well, according to the paradigm that we have here, first of all, he hovers over chaos. And then the next thing he does is he speaks to it. <laughs> Verse 2 says, and God said. And that's enough right there. That God's tool for dealing with darkness and disorder and destruction is God's word. That God's word pierces through the thickness of the chaos. And, and he says, let there be, mm -hmm. he says, let there, let there be, let there be, let there be. He pierces through this chaos, and when he does, it's very interesting that in Genesis chapter 1, there are, there are at least 10 forms of let there be in that chapter. Which means that the original Ten Commandments are not in Exodus 20, but in Genesis 1. In Exodus 20, God commands humanity. In Genesis 1, God commands the universe. And the blessing is that the universe has kept all the commandments. Because he says, let that be. Can I preach tonight? When God says, let there be, the night Sinai skies came into existence. When God said, let there be, the veil of the Milky Way came into being. When God said, let there be, the pathways of comets came to existence. All God has to do is preach to chaos. No wonder when Jesus came, he did not come protesting. He did not come politicking. He came preaching. Because the best way to deal with chaos is to preach. Every Sunday, the preacher ought to stand up. She ought to stand up. He ought to stand up and say, let there be. 
Because Paul said, y'all don't mind if I preach in here, that, that, that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching. And the reason why God chose the foolishness of preaching to save humanity is because it was the foolishness of preaching that actually gave birth to humanity. And whatever was involved in our making is involved in our remaking. I'm doing my best. See, he said, let there be. Let there be. Let there be. Notice how authoritative is. God's word is not legislative. It's executive. <laughs> He doesn't need anybody to vote on what he says. Every preacher ought to stand up with a humble authority. Humble because we're sinners saved by grace. Authority because we have a derived, God's authority is inherent. Your authority is derived as a result of being connected to one who has inherent authority. That's why every time you stand, you are the preacher. Preach a little while. You are the one. Go ahead and preach. In a humble authority, there is no room for vanity or conceit. But there is room for a humble authority. The Bible says, let there be. How easy is that? Those, those words just kind of roll off. Let there be. God doesn't have to work at it. God doesn't have to force it out. Just let that James Weldon Johnson says in his creation poem that God smiled and light came. C.S. Lewis in his Narnia Chronicles says that Aslan uh, simply opened his mouth and starts singing. And when he starts singing, the ground around him starts turning green. The sky above starts turning blue. You're going to catch it. So all James Weldon Johnson says is all God had to do was smile. C.S. Lewis said all God had to do was sing. The Bible said all God had to do was speak. Do you see how easy that is? Your chaos is easy for God. It might be hard for you. But all God has to do is smile. All God has to do is speak. All God has to do is sing. And he's able to dispel some of, I know this is too simple for some of y'all, but I want you to go home from this conference knowing that whatever chaos you face, God is able to simply smile, sing, or speak to it. And it has to go away because chaos does not do well around God. <laughs> Let there, the bridge between chaos and cosmos is the word of God. I'm sorry, and I do not apologize for it, but I still believe that the church rises and falls on its preaching. I still believe that preaching has to be at the center of churches and therefore at the center of theological institutions. I still believe in the power of the preached word. It seems like some of y'all still believe in the power of the preach. In some other places, preaching has fallen on hard times. But I believe there's some sisters and brothers here at Virginia Union who still believe that there's power in how shall they hear without a preacher. Do I have a witness here? At the word of God still, I don't care after redaction criticism, his word still stands. After literary criticism, his word still stands. After historical criticism, his word still, go ahead, critique the Bible, do all you want to do, but the word of God still, go ahead and preach a little while. Well, good night. May the Lord bless you real good. But I want you to know that God is able to deal with our chaos. What does God do with chaos? First of all, he hovers over it. Then he speaks to it. But then he co-ops chaos. <laughs> it's all right here, preachers. Can I preach the Bible? It's all right there. I, I, I love it because the Bible says that God said, let there be. And whatever God says to be has to come to fruition. When God says, let there be, 
all of the legions of possibility come running to the fore. When, when God says, let there be to light, light says the darkness don't mean you any harm, but God says, I got to be. Let there be light. And guess what? When, when God said, let there be light, there was light. That's very interesting. Light was created on the first day. The sun was not created until the fourth day. Which means there was light before there was sun. Which means the source of the light was not the sun, but the glory of God. <laughs> Y'all not helping me. So no matter how dark it, even on cloudy days, there can still be light. Because Revelation said in heaven that there, will not, there won't be a lead, need for the sun nor the moon to shine because the sun himself, the S-O-N, will shine even when your life is dark. Glory can still appear. There was light before there was sun. Look what, what happened. God saw the light and God saw the darkness. And, and, and God called the darkness evening and called the light morning or day. So there was evening, there was morning. Look at the order. Not morning, evening. Evening, morning. Which means the day begins with evening. That evening is included in the day. Don't let nobody fool you, make you think that if you are living faithfully and if you are righteous, you won't have to deal with any evenings. No, because evening is a part of the deal. Evening and, I wish I had help, evening and morning. I don't care, quick, you be careful, these folks promising you that you're about to walk into your season or your breakthrough is on the way. I don't know anything about that, but I do know life involves evening and morning. Do I have any honest people in here who would admit with me that your life has known some dark evenings? But it's also known some bright mornings because evening and morning go together. I got to leave you. I'm a Baptist preacher, so we close about two or three times. So let, let, me, let, let me get out of here. I want you to know that, that, that it was evening and morning. Now, what's, what's interesting is that evening and darkness were the same thing. Darkness had been a characteristic of chaos. But once God said, let there be, God co-ops what was a part of the former reign. He brings it in, reformats it, and uses it for his own purpose. Because the darkness was necessary to create evening. And evening was necessary in order for you to rest. So God takes what was a characteristic of chaos. He puts his hand on it. And he uses it for his own purpose and for your glory. Am I looking at anybody here who has a testimony? That God has taken some darkness in your own life. That God has taken some very negative experiences. And God has reformatted them and used them for your good and used them for God's purpose. Maybe I'm in the wrong place on tonight, but it feels like I have a few people here who would testify and say, Pastor, I've had some dark days. I've had some difficult days. I've had some days where I thought I was finished, but the Lord took my dark days. Do I have a witness here? He, he took my dark days and he reformatted them and used them for his own glory. Do I have any sisters in the house who have that testimony? Do I have any brothers in the house who have a testimony like Joseph? Joseph looked at his brothers and said, what you meant for evil, God has used it for my good. Come here, Jesus. Come here, Jesus. Y'all don't mind if I talk about Jesus. You don't mind if I talk about the cross. Because at the cross, God took. I said, at the cross, God took. He took the indecisiveness of Pilate. 
He took the viciousness of the high priests. He took the, um, uh, the, the, the bad feelings of the guards and the soldiers. He took the ill intent of one thief. He took the duplicity of Judas. He took the denials of Peter and he co-opted them and used them for his own glory. And because of all of that, we have salvation. Because of all of that, we have second chance. I got to leave you now. But before I go, after God was done with all of that, the Bible says that God pat himself on the back. He looked at light and he looked at darkness and he said, it is good. When God got rid of chaos, God started praising God. God started worshiping God. I don't think that God should have to praise God. If the Lord has done something about your chaos, then you ought to lift up your hands. You ought to open up your mouth and give him the glory. I got to leave you now. And I know I'm at a school, but take your neighbor by the hand and look at him in the eye. Tell him I've had some chaos, but he hovered over me. I've had some chaos, but he spoke to me. I've had some chaos, and he co-opted it. Is there anybody here who knows that God will take care of your chaos? God will take care of your darkness. God will. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Is there anybody here who knows that he's able? He's able. He's able. Yeah. Yeah. Come on and bless his name. Come on and bless his name. Yeah. Won't he hover over you? Won't he speak to you? Won't he co-opt you? Every time I turn around, he keeps on blessing me. Every time, yeah, that I turn around, he keeps What, um, what a lot of you don't understand was that the planning of this has been chaos. But God wouldn't let it fail because the Spirit's been hovering. Paul, they don't understand, Colin. But I need you to touch three folk and tell them, I feel a shift in my life, my ministry, my process. I want to warn you, if you don't like praise, 
you might want to put up the finger and leave right now. Because there's some people in this room that's been dealing with the chaos. But God just told you, it's already all right. Look down your row and tell your neighbor, it's already all right. All right. People, people try to make statements about seminary and say that there's no spirit. And, and then there are people who try to interpret this activity and say it's not necessary. But when God has given you victory, in the chaos. All right, that's that's good. That's good. That's good. Let's get ready to go. Hold on, hold on, say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's let's get ready to go. Um, I ain't trying to kill your spirit. It ain't got nothing to do with being in the seminary. I'm the chief worship leader, and the one thing I do have is discernment. And let me tell you why. Because I want us to pray. And here's why. And I need you to hear this. My prayer for Ellis, Joan, is that you are so refreshed and inspired so God can trust you with the next revelation of your reason for being. Sometimes our response to the chaos is a violent response we think we call praise. When the real response in my feeble understanding of chaos is obedience. That when it gets tough and when it's unsure, when your emotions are out of alignment with God's will and when you're frustrated and when you're tired it is your obedience to God that keeps you from the nervous breakdown assigned to your season and you can be deep all you want and you can do your thing and you can be prophetic and apostolic but all of us know what it feels like when you got an issue and no answers. When you're just crying out to God for God to move.
move things around and God leaves them. God hover. So I want us to pray. And here's why. Because whatever, and see what's interesting, because a mutual friend of ours is a Psalms genius. He's a master based in a preaching Psalms. Psalm 77, he shared a verse with us on our national pastor's prayer. And it says, and the waters tremble at the sight of God. And he made this statement. Whatever you're afraid of is afraid of God. Aye, aye. So we're going to leave here tonight. And if you don't leave here, I'm going to leave here. Confident that everything else I can't fix is afraid of God. That the stuff I couldn't move yesterday, God has already shifted while I was sitting there because what comes after me has still got to come through God. Stop complaining about your class load. If you're supposed to be here, you're going to walk across this stage and you're going to make every struggle obey your obedience. Because I will not let this seminary under my leadership forget it's still about God. Is it still God? It's still God, Dr. Kim. So we're going to pray. And I want you to be encouraged that the chaos has already submitted. You just ain't spoke to it yet. It's already submitted. It's already in order. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to leave. And then we go going to sleep. And we're going to sleep all night. Because stress won't go to bed with me tonight. Okay, I'm speaking for myself. I won't wake up at 3.30 this day. Because God's already got it. Some folk can't handle how you handle life. So we're going to pray. Because we still, at the School of Theology, believe in prayer. Because our ancestors didn't get through hell politicking. They got through hell because they could pray. Now, if you're comfortable, you can take somebody's hand. If not, you don't have to. You can stay back there. Or you can come to the altar. don't really matter. But I'm inviting you tonight to address the chaos to submit yourself to God. Because you will leave Ellison Jones stronger than you came. And our school will thrive even with the chaos. It's just the voices. And those who are watching us in your bedroom, in your car, in your living room, if you have the space to do it, just get on your knees. Because tonight, we get our strength back. We get our encouragement back. Any worshipers in here? Trust me. 
Worshippers know what to do right about now. If you will Your tears matter to God. Trust me. Your wondering matter to God. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. One more time. If you. If you Trust. Trust me. Leave it all right here. Trust. Trust me. Trust. Now everybody in this room, open your mouth and begin to pray. Come on, open your mouth. I pray for our professors tonight. The demand that many of them are feeling trying to manage virtual steel emails that don't always work and trying to handle the building out of canvas and being asked to teach in an environment they never wanted to I pray for every student that has a load that's greater than they could ever imagine God hasn't stopped their life from functioning, but God's added the demand of scholarship. Don't let them get discouraged. Some of them are too close. I know the money ain't always there, but in the name of the Lord Jesus, some of you just need to be encouraged that your church is gonna be all right. They ain't coming, but you keep showing up. And God will honor your labor. Some of y'all are acting too cute for where you are. Desperate people get responses from God. So open your mouth and talk to God like you need him. Now nah, y'all still acting cute. We can we get out of here. It's only 8.30. The restaurant's going to be open when you get out of here. But you need to walk out of here confident in who you are. Come on. Come on. Come on, for the next 30 seconds. If other folk are ready to leave, you tell them you go. But I spent money to come here. I changed my schedule to get here. I left some crisis to get here. Ay, 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 ay. Ay, 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 ay. So God, do whatever you got to do tonight. I need to leave here stronger than when I came. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, thank you, thank you. Get ready to go. I don't feel no waste time. Come too far from where I started. Nobody at the road. everybody together. I don't. I don't feel no to leave.
Amen. We're not doing the benediction. We'll see you tomorrow. Students, if you want to come to the luncheon, there is a QR code that will be available as well. Those who are looking for ministry opportunities, there's a church that came with positions available. And I want you to open yourself up. It may take you to another state, but it may also take you to another season. The Antioch Church is here. Their pastor is here. And they're ready to interview you if you're willing to take advantage of the opportunity. We'll make sure in the morning that that opportunity is available. Nine o'clock tomorrow, we start. So we get here at 845. Bishop Lee Alfred Thomas is our preacher. And then we're going to have a series of conversations. 1230, we go to the Trinity Family Life Center on Deal Road for our time with Dean Emeritus Kenny. Then we'll come back tomorrow night to hear an amazing woman of God. We'll see you. We are the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. And we are proud and bold. Students, please, if you want to participate in the luncheon, we got spaces. Please take advantage. We love you. We'll see you tomorrow. Nobody. I don't believe. We'll see you tomorrow.